Let's, uh, let's shift gears uh, because um, uh, it is time to get those, uh, those filings done with the regulator. Uh, so Cameron, what, what is it you're, you're looking for this year? Well, thanks, Don. Uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about some of the areas that we've been focusing on in financial reporting over the past while. Before I do that, I just want to mention that the views I'm about to express are my own and not the views of the Ontario Securities Commission or its staff. Um, what we like to do when we look at uh, financial reporting is think about what new standards are in the capital markets and have a look at those. IFRS 10 is the new consolidation standard that was uh, implemented in 2013 in our capital markets. And there's some new concepts in that standard, concepts about control that have changed since the old standard, uh, a, a lot more uh, disclosures as well. We looked at a bunch of issuers in this area, and the majority of issues that issuers that we looked at, there wasn't a lot of impact going from the old standard, to, old standard to the new standard. I probably would have expected more impact on the de facto control situation, where there's less than 50% of the voting rights, but in fact the entity does, does actually control, and the new standard has more guidance on that than ever before. So I thought we would have seen a bit more uh, uh, of those types of consolidations. To me, the big observation on this standard is on disclosure and providing good information as to why a parent does control a subsidiary. That's really what's important. I've got a couple of examples. The first one is um, an example of some, I would call boilerplate disclosure. It, it, it's a company indicates that they control the entity when they have power over the entity and power exists when they have rights to direct the relevant activities and it can be obtained through voting rights and, or other means and as such management's determined that it has control. So not much insight there. This is really just the definition out of the standard. It doesn't really tell you much behind the thinking. Whereas the next uh, disclosure is a bit more tailored. It talks about the company owning 48% of the voting rights, so one of those de facto control situations I was talking about. The remaining 52% are widely held and no one has uh, more than 1%. Previously the company did not think it met the control criteria under the old standard, but under the new one they do believe they have the outright power to govern the policies and so therefore they are consolidating because they believe they have the unilateral right to direct all activities. So again, just more information behind the thinking as to how management assessed that the company controlled a subsidiary. So greater information on the judgments, more insight, not just, not just information. And I think if you flip this last example around, if the company held 48% and didn't consolidate, well, there's some judgment and some thinking as to why the entity made that determination, and that would be good disclosure for an investor to understand why that's the case. IFRS 13 is the uh, new accounting standard on fair value. That's effective for 2014 uh, periods. And as we know, the concept of fair value is scattered throughout IFRS, so this standard touches upon many areas. And we are looking at the application of that standard in our capital markets and how companies are doing in that area. For example, how have entities been uh, applying various valuation techniques? How have they been applying the fair value hierarchy, which is in IFRS 13? And there's certainly an increased level of disclosure, and that's important because there's a lot of judgments and estimates that go into fair value. And having uh, disclosures about those judgments, in particular when you have unobservable inputs, for example, understanding how those fair values are arrived at are important for investors to understand. Not just the number, but, but the inputs and why. There's a lot of activity in the, uh, the REIT sector, so that's an area that certainly IFRS 13 comes into play, and that's a hot segment that we've been doing some, some looking at. The next topic I want to touch upon was um, the CSA staff notice that produces the results, that reports the results of all the continuous disclosure reviews across the country. That's CSA staff notice 51341. It discusses common deficiencies in financial statements, MDNA provides some helpful guidance, helpful suggestions, and some examples. I'd urge you to have a look at that uh, notice. There's a good example on revenue recognition, for example, the revenue recognition policy, and it, 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 it talks about a generic revenue recognition policy and the fact that that could trigger a question from the regulator if it's not tailored specifically to your, your situation so that an investor can understand how revenue is being recognized. Revenue is obviously very important. Impairment of assets is also discussed in that notice. Uh, often there's not enough information about what were the events and circumstances that led up to impairment. So again, more insights 
is what I, what I think is needed in terms of trying to understand some of these financial statement measurements. The notice also talks about MD&A deficiencies, for example, forward-looking information. Uh, for example, if there's uh, sales growth estimates that, it's, that are included in the MD&A, why, why are they projected the way they are? Are there new products coming on stream? Are there new customers? Again, more insight as to why those numbers are there and, and, and why those are arri arrived at by the entity. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that notice. We've also got some new proposals for venture issuers that will be uh, hopefully finalized during the course of 2015. So they're not effective now, but you can look out for those coming on stream soon. And these new venture issuer proposals are designed to streamline the uh, uh, requirements for smaller public companies and make sure that the regulatory burden is appropriate for them, and also to focus on disclosures that's appropriate for investors that are investing in these types of smaller companies. One example is the quarterly financial, uh, the quarterly highlights report. And that's something that will be produced to um, allow the venture issuer to focus on the operations and liquidity, and that would be in place of the full-blown MD&A requirements that are currently in place. So a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, concepts in, for smaller companies that you can look forward to, and I would encourage you to, to be on the lookout for those being uh, issued in final in the next year. Lastly, I just wanted to mention some new requirements that are in place now for disclosure of the uh, number of women on the board of directors and in executive positions. Also, disclosures are required for policies relating to um, representation of women on, on boards and in executive positions, as well as any targets that are in place for, again, uh, representation of women on boards and in uh, executive positions. There's other requirements, but those are three that I thought I would highlight for you, and I would encourage you to look at those uh, closely as you uh, prepare your filings for this year. These, these disclosures are designed to help investors uh, well, for transparency purposes, that will allow investors to make an investment decision on these important topics or a voting decisions. So it will help them in that regard to understand uh, these features. With that, Don, I thought I would turn it back to you.